Well, we began a brand new series last week called, help me out, Dig In, Dig In. And if you remember last week, we laid the, the, the groundwork, so to speak, the, the principle of digging, digging ditches. All over God's word, he communicates to us what he desires for our life. And what God desires for your life is that you would thrive. So he uses this analogy of, of, of plants, and he talks about these thriving plants. Let me show it to you in, in scripture in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Uh, Psalm chapter 1, I think we have it. Do we have Psalm chapter 1? There's, there it is. Uh, that's Second Peter. We're not there yet. Let's go to Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Do we not have it? Did I, I didn't give it to you. Never mind. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 says this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he meditates day and night. Now watch this. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does shall prosper. Scripture is saying that, that those who are gods, they are those who thrive. Their, their leaf doesn't wither. All that they do, does, all that they do prospers. They're, they're a thriving leaf, and Scripture speaks this over our lives. And God gives us these promises all over his word. But here's the problem for you and I, um, folks, friends, is that I believe a lot of times what we read in Scripture, tell me if you feel this way, what you read in Scripture and what you're actually experiencing with your life is different. Anyone with me? Like there's a disconnect sometimes. There's like, God wants me thriving. Oh, that sounds good, but I'm not. Anyone with me? So like um, all that he does will prosper. In the middle of drought, he's still fruitful. And you're like, in the middle of a drought, I'm, I'm dry. <laughs> like that's, that's what's happening when I'm in a drought. And so there's this, it feels like there's this disconnect between where we are and what scripture's speaking over our, our life. And so what we're after in this series is we want to pave the way to close that disconnect that we would truly live in what God has for our lives, that you would truly thrive. And so the, the beginning principle for us was this last week, that we would dig ditches. We'd pick up a shovel. And we, we talked about this principle that God, God performs miracles, amen? God works in the life of his children. But we often expect God to snap a finger. God, would you do this? Oh, yeah, here, snap. The water jugs are full. We want God to snap a finger. God, in this situation, just snap your finger. And God goes, God, God rarely snaps a finger. What he'll often do is he'll, he'll point a finger. Like, oh, you want, you want water? Here you go, dig a ditch. Start there. Oh, you want your marriage blast? Oh, hey, there you go. Just love your wife. Like, start there. Like, love your wife. Oh, it's, it's a little, okay, so get counseling. Uh, oh, you want, you want and, and God will often point his finger. So, so a lot of us are looking for God to snap his fingers. Just snap your finger. God's like, no, 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 uh, point a finger. And I think, he goes, start there. And I think a lot of people find themselves frustrated today. A lot of people give God a shot, and when God doesn't do what they want him to do, he doesn't snap a finger, they, they bail on God, and the church, God, God doesn't love, oh no, he, doesn't, he loves you, he loves you enough to point out what it is you're supposed to be doing, what he wants to bless, and so they dug the ditches, and, and as they dug the ditches, what they found is that their ditch digging efforts prepared the way for the miraculous, God worked, he sent the water, he filled the ditches, and the ditches you are digging, my friends, will be filled with the water that God sends. Amen, church, you with me? So here's what we're going to do. We want to look at some specific ditches that God in his word calls us to dig, ditches that we know God is going to bless. And so today, what we want to look at together, it's one of my favorite topics. It's the topic of digging into knowing God. We got to dig into knowing God, okay? So that's what we're going to look at today. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 say this. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through, everyone say through, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through, everyone say through, our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Listen to what scripture is saying, my friends. Everything you need for life and godliness is provided for you through the knowledge of God. Everything you need to live the life God has called you to live is given to you, provided for you through 
an ever-increasing knowledge of God, the grace, the peace, the strength is given to you through the knowledge of him who calls us. That's the delivery system we need. Colossians chapter one, let's look at that together. Colossians chapter one, and a little bit of a background story, the Colossians is this, of what was happening with the Colossians. The Colossians were a people in pursuit of, of fullness. They wanted life change. And so they were trying all sorts of new tactics. They were reading all sorts of new books. They were, they were dabbling in some other religions and, and trying to find fullness. And so Paul writes to them and, uh, and he says this, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the what? With the knowledge. He says, we're asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. So we want to see you living a life worthy. We want to see you pleasing him. Where does it come from? Well, we're praying that God would fill you with the knowledge of who he is, the knowledge of his will. Watch, bearing fruit in every good work and continuing, watch, to grow in the knowledge of God. Or literally, it means as you're growing in the knowledge of God. This is the bedrock. See, as you're growing in the knowledge of God, you're able then to live a life that pleases him. You're able to live a life that's worthy of the Lord. You're, 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 you're bearing fruit. Your, your life has meaning and purpose, and there's, there's, there's momentum in your life when you're growing in the knowledge of the Lord. So here's what Paul's saying to the, the Colossians. He's saying, you want to be full? Then fill yourself with the knowledge of him. Listen. Some of you are in here today and you are longing to be full. You, you, you feel like you're running on empty. You're struggling and you're straining. And God's word to you today is you want to be full? Fill yourself. Fill yourself overflowing with the knowledge of him. Listen, his will, his heart, his mind. Then, Colossians is saying, you will walk worthy then, when you fill yourself with the knowledge of God, then you will be pleasing. You will be fruitful. You'll be strengthened with might. How am I strengthened with might? When I'm filled with the knowledge of him. How do we thrive? It's the big question. How do we thrive? Here's how you thrive. It's an ever-increasing knowledge of God. This is the ditch we've got to learn to dig. A, 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 Digging into an ever-increasing knowledge of, of God. Let me break it down real practically for us. If you go into a situation and you say, I'm going to fix this problem. So think about a problem, a situation in your life right now, okay? And you think to yourself, I'm going to fix this problem. If you go into your problem like that, you go into a situation like that, I will tell you this right now up front, listen to me, let me save you some time, it will not work. You're telling yourself today, I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna fix this problem. It's not gonna work. You're gonna find yourself frustrated. But if you go into the problem saying, I want to know the Lord in this, things shift, things change. Now it's not you going in to fix the problem. Now it's you seeking to know God, seeking to grow in the knowledge of God in the midst of your problem. I want to know God in this. There's a shift that takes place. You position your life to thrive. You position your life for change. It gets you under the waterfall of who God is, and you get caught up in the momentum of who God is. And as you're under that waterfall and under that momentum, it God and the knowledge of God, and as you're growing in the knowledge of God, your life is empowered to live the life God's calling you to live, to make the changes that need to be made, to address the problem in the way that it needs to be addressed. So there's two different approaches. I'm going to fix this, or I'm going to know God in the midst of this. Are you with me? What we need to do is grow in the knowledge of God. When we start with the knowledge of God, here's what happens. It starts with, the, it starts with knowing God. Watch this, so important. And when you know God, it leads to loving God. And loving will lead to doing. Watch, let's build, a, let's build a, a foundation and put some things on it, all right? Some of you are in here today, and here's the, here's the top, here's, here's your life. You're trying to do. 
Okay, just picture a box and it says do. And you're just trying to do and it, and you can't really do it. You know, there's water and you're just kind of floating and you're trying to stay above water, okay? But you're drowning because you're trying to do. What you need, see, some of you are doing that. I'm going to try and do. What you need is underneath to lay a foundation that upholds the doing in your life, okay? That foundation, right underneath that is loving God. See, loving God, another box, loving God. Loving God enables you to do what God's calling you to do, to do the things you're trying to do because you love God. But how are you going to love God? You can't love God until you put another box down here called knowing God. See, what happens is if you know God, who he is, then you'll love God. And when you love God, you're going to serve God. What we call it is loving that leads to not just doing, but loving that leads to worshiping. That's what worship is. Knowing God. And the more you know about God, I'm convinced that the more you know about God, the more you're going to love God. If the more you know about God doesn't cause you to love God, then you're getting to know the wrong God. People are twisting scripture in there. Because when you know God, you fall in love with God. Amen? And when you fall in love with God, you just want to serve God. You're like, God, I, I, I want to do your will. I, I want to do what you're... God, I, I, there's now... Listen, now there's a foundation to do what I'm supposed to do. There's a foundation to do all God's calling me to do because I, I love him. I love him because I know him. So Paul to the Colossians is, here's what we're praying. I'm not going to tell you to go do this, do this, do this. He's telling, here's what I'm going to tell you. Just know God. Because if you know God, you're going to love God. And if you love God, you're going to worship God. And that worship is going to be spurred on and upheld by a knowledge of who God is and a deep love for what you know. Is that making sense? Are you with me? So, very specifically, you can fight to remain pure, right? You can fight to remain pure because you were told to remain pure. I was at a purity conference, talking to high school students, college students, right? Even in marriage, purity continues into your marriage. So, you can fight to remain pure because you were told to remain pure. Here's, here's good luck with that. Because, see, you walk out there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remain pure because someone told me to remain pure. What you will start doing is, is it's, it's called a behavioral management system that you put on your life. You're going you're gonna to cause yourself to behave, and now you're constantly, it's a behavioral management system, and you're trying to, you're trying to be pure, and you're trying, and it's all based on this behavioral management system. Let me tell you something. You're going to get tired real quick. You're going to tap out real quick. You're going to find yourself drowning real quick. It just, it's frustrating and it's tiring when you're, when you're trying to do it based on, I, I was told to, right? I, I need to. So you can fight to remain pure because you're told to, or you can fight to remain pure because you know God. Because I know God, I love God, and, and I want to remain pure. Why? Because I love God. Why do you love God? Because I know God. You follow me? Now, all of a sudden, my remaining pure, the thing I'm after, has a foundation. Without that foundation, it's going to crack the first, the first time there's pressure put upon it. So the thing we need to run after is the foundation. It's knowing God. Let's talk about some big words. Knowing God. We know God. That's What we know about God is our theology, our knowledge of God, theology, what is our knowledge of God? And a lot of people love theology, you know, we, we want to know theology and yes, amen, but what you need to realize is that theology is given to us for the purpose of us not quoting theology or sitting in coffee shops and talking deep theology. Well, that's fun, but listen, if theology does not lead you to what's called doxology, what's doxology? That's the worship of God. If your theology does not lead you to doxology, you've got the wrong theology. You with me? Because what theology is supposed to do is not make you, you know, the goal of theology is not so that you can quote what you know about God. The, the goal of theology is to get you to fall in love with God. And enjoy him forever. And then now that I love God and I know God, I, I serve God with my life. And I know people who are super deep in their theology, but there's just no doxology dripping from their life. 
That's not proper. That's not the knowing God he desires. Some of you think about knowing God and you're like, oh yeah, I've got that card. God created the heavens and the earth. I know that about God. And you're, you're reading to me facts and figures about God, like the, the back of like your favorite baseball card. And now that's how you know God. Like with all the, and you could, I put some verses on my Facebook too. But that's not the knowing he's talking about. Theology needs to lead to doxology, which is you love God and then you worship God. That's the knowing God is after. Jesus told, Jesus told the Pharisees, he says, you search the scriptures daily because in them you think you have life. It's these scriptures, these the theology, theology, theology. He goes, they are which that testify of who? Me. Me. Scripture and your theology needs to point you into a love relationship with, with Jesus. Amen, church? It's knowing that needs to be our aim. And digging into knowing him. And it frustrates me in our society today because I think we get, we get off this point so easily. We, 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 we move from this, this simple truth. I mean, you ever notice like in Christian bookstores, if I could pick on them for a second, not all of them, but most of them. In Christian bookstores, we've gotten away from knowing God and we, now we just want to know stuff about ourselves. And so like the titles are all your, you know, me, mine. It's all, it's all about you. Well, the problem is, if all we do is ever talk about who you are, it's depressing. It's just depressing. You know, you sprinkle a little verse, you sprinkle a little verse. What you need to do is read books. That's good, fine, fine, fine. But your foundation needs to not be about you. You need to read books about who God is. Like Tozer writing, like, the knowledge of the holy. Okay, like, read that book. Like, who's God? And when you know God, and can follow them. Read a book about the names of God. Dig into what all the different names, Jehovah Kizikanu and, and Adonaiyata and all, all these. Who is God? And when you fall deeper into the knowledge of God, you're going to fall more in love with God. And so we, we, we slip from this truth and we start focusing on me. Focusing on me. What do I need to do? Who's me? And what do I, 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 I? Like, stop for a second. Just get to know God. You with me? Just get to know Jesus. Church, you with me? Amen. So, here's the question. Okay, we got the, the worshiping or the doing up here on the top. Underneath that is this a love for God. Underneath that is this knowing God. But here's the question. What is knowing? What's the foundation of knowing God? Like, of these three things, doing, loving, knowing, what's the bottom part? The foundation of knowing God. In other words, here's the question. Is how do we know God? Okay. Here's what you need to understand, is that the knowledge of God is given to us through the Word of God. The knowledge of God is given to you through the Word of God. So the foundation of it all is the, help me, Word of God. Without the Word of God, I, there's no way I can know God. If, if I don't know God, I can't love God. If I'm not loving God, I'm not going to worship God. So we've got to understand, say it with me, the Word of God. The Word of God has to be and is the foundation. Getting to know the Word of God allows you to know the God of the Word, and that's the point. As you get to know the Word of God, you come to know the God of the Word. And when you know the God of the Word, you're enabled and empowered to thrive in the way God intends. It starts with you knowing the Word of God, which lets you know the God of the Word. And then when you know the God of the Word, you love Him and you want to serve Him with your life. The Word of God and knowing the Word of God in, empowers us, to, it lays that foundation to where we can thrive in the way God intends. And there's something very supernatural about it as well. It's, it's a, our worship, doing things, and this wasn't in my notes, but I just, I've, all of the scriptures see that do, there's people who do things, and then there's people who do things with the foundation of loving Jesus and, and worshiping Jesus. Those who are just doing things will struggle and fail and fall and break. Those who are doing things based on a love relationship with Jesus, the act of worship, there's a supernatural empowerment in their doing, okay? Because there's, there's, this, there's this spiritual foundation in what they're doing. God anoints the worship of his people, the doing of his people, when there's this foundation. And so the depths of that, I don't think we can, we can comprehend of how God blesses those who have the Word of God, 
who love God and worship God. John 15, John chapter 15, verse 5 through 8, just to kind of blow our minds for a second, okay? Watch this. John chapter 15, verse 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Amen? Everyone wants some of that, right? Come on, let's bear so much fruit. That sounds good. Apart from me, you can do how much stuff? Nothing stuff. You can't do any stuff, okay? If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and it withers. Such a branch is picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Next verse. If you remain in me, watch this, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Let's back that up. You are shown to be my disciples when you bear much fruit, when you're, and, uh, you're glorifying God when you're bearing much fruit. As you're glorifying God, you will bear much fruit. The way you're going to glorify God is that his words are going to remain in you, and you're going to ask what you wish, and it'll be done for you. How will when his words remain in you? Can somebody say, wow? I'm like, wow. Wow. Thank you, Raya. That's my daughter in the front saying, wow, really loud. I don't know that we fully know or understand exactly what that means. My words remain in you and whatever... And ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. When my words remain in you, when the foundation of your life is his word, he says, ask whatever you wish and it'll be be done for you. I don't know that we can fully understand exactly what that means, but we do know that this context is bearing much fruit. It's glorifying God. We also know that this fruit bearing and God glorifying and prayer answering is directly tied to what? What? to the word of Jesus abiding in us. When the word of Jesus is abiding in us, we're glorifying God, bearing fruit, where our prayers are being answered, where it's, it's all tied to this word of God, word of Jesus in our hearts. So let me, let me give you like three possibilities of what, what this could be, just so you understand the power of the word, okay? This could be that the word of God will, will first of all, um, teach us how we should pray. Maybe it's just that his word teaches us how we should pray. And what scripture says in, in John 1, or John, 1 John 5 says this, that, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So maybe it's just that the word of God is teaching us how we should pray, and now when we pray, we're asking according to his will, and when we ask according to his will, he, he, he hears us. Maybe that's what scripture's talking about. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that the word of God uh, strengthens our faith, okay? Um, this is the next one, that he, he strengthens our faith. Faith allows us to lay hold of the answer. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says this, and if we know that he hears us, and whatever we ask, we know, or this is the last part of First John. Let's go to the next verse, two down. There we go. Therefore, I tell you that Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have it and you will receive it and it'll be, it'll be yours. So maybe it's just that the word of God strengthens our faith so that when we ask, we're, we're, we're going to, to believe. Or another verse on faith, Romans 10, says this, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when we hear the word of God, our faith is strengthened. And now when my faith is strengthened and I go to God in prayer, there's this, there's this power behind my faith because my faith is based on a, on a knowledge that's based on the word of God. So my faith has a backbone, so to speak. You with me? Like it's not just faith for faith's sake. It's faith with a backbone. Like I know what I believe and why I believe it. I, I, I know God's word as the foundation. Or maybe it's this, that the, that the word frees us from sin. Maybe it's just that, that the word frees us from sin. Um, sin keeps us from seeing answer to our prayer. Did you know that? When we're harboring sin in our, in our lives. Uh, Psalm 66 verse 18 says this. It says, if you had cherished iniquity, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. You're, you're cherishing iniquity. And God, do this, God, do this. God's like, deal with that first. But God wants you to do that if you deal with that, right? Like God's like, get on page with me. And then we can talk about all this, but get, get, on, get on page with me. Uh, John 17, 17. 
So sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. So the word sets us apart. It helps us to, to see the sin in our life and to deal with it. It's the word of God that, that helps us deal and address the issues of sin in our life. And so I don't know that we could ever understand the full implications of what, what Jesus is saying here. But what we can understand is it has everything to do with his word abiding in us. That the fruit bearing and prayer answering and this life empowered by the spirit of God in a very supernatural way has everything to do with the word of God abiding in you. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain where? In you. So here's the question. Where is the word of God in John 15? Where is it? We're looking for it. God, where's your word? Someone say it with me. The word of God is in me in me. This is what makes all the difference in the world. The Word of God in you, as opposed to the Word of God outside me, right? So it's moved, watch, from just simply in my Bible. It's just the Word of God. It's, it's in my Bible, or it's on my iPad, or on my phone. It's, it's on that Facebook wall. I, I read a verse, you know? It's it's out there, and something has transpired where the Word of God has gone from outside me to now the Word of God is, say it with me, in me. It's in me. When it gets in me, see, and that's, the, that's the, the key. That's the hinge point. The Word of God becoming in us, when it's in me, my life and my walk with God is given a proper foundation, and it positions me to flourish, it positions me to thrive, it enables me in a very supernatural way to live out everything God has for me, because it helps me to love God, it helps me then to, or it helps me to know God, it helps me then to love God, it helps me then to serve God. There's this foundation when the Word of God gets in me, in me. Psalm 119, verse 11. It says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've, put, I've taken your word and I've, I've tucked it in here that I might not sin against you. So what scripture is saying here is that, that the life that glorifies God on the outside has God's word on the inside. The life that's living for God on the outside and, and flourishing on the outside, what's happening in it? Well, it's got the word of God in on the inside. The word of God, my friends is what fuels me and strengthens me in a very real supernatural way that we sometimes can't quite comprehend or understand. The Word of God fuels me and it strengthens me. The, the Old Testament refers to the Word of God as something that you actually have to consume, that you take in as food. and say, I ate your words. I ate them. I got them in me. It's reflecting this desire. I want to get your word in me. I consumed your word. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. I want you to see this. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. It says, remember how the Lord your God led you, talking to the children of Israel, led you all the way into the wilderness these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order that you might know, in order that uh, you, for you to know what was in your heart. I love that because God's going, it's not that I need to know what's in your heart. You need to know what's in your heart. Whether or not you would keep his commandments. Next verse. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then fed you with manna. Who knows this story? The feeding of the manna. Raise your hand. Come on. Some of you, you know the story. Manna. Manna simply means when you translate it, what is it? That's what it means. What are you eating? I'm, what is it? I don't, that's what I'm asking you. What is it? That's what I'm eating. It's called what is it? They didn't know what it was, so they called it what is it? So God... God fed them with, this, with manna as they, in a miraculous way as they were moving through the desert, okay? And when they'd wake up in the morning, the manna would be out there, and they'd have to go collect the manna. They're like, what is this stuff? That's a great name for it. Just call it, what is it? And they made all sorts of things like banana bread, manna cotti, and anyway, <laughs> um, thank you very much, which he says... <laughs> He fed you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. You guys didn't know what it was. Watch this next verse. To teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. He says that whole experiment in the desert, every, the, the, the whole experience in the desert was meant to teach you some, something, that man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth. And you're going, wait, hang on a second. I thought it was manna. Yeah. But what God is saying here in in Deuteronomy is that that manna was a type. 
It was meant to represent what's provided from God, his word. The manna was meant to represent the word of God. He said, I wanted to teach you. And it's not about just eating physical food. You need the stuff that comes from heaven. And sometimes when you're eating the stuff that comes from heaven, you're like, what is it? I, I don't quite understand it. It's like, eat, eat, eat God's word. Because God's word fuels your life for what God has called you to do. You've got to take it in. God's word is spiritual food. It's like the original soul food, right? And if you're not, if you're not consuming soul food, your soul is hungry. Like you, your faith is malnourished. Your, your, your faith, when you don't feed it, it atrophies. It gets sickly. You have no strength to pull from. So, so listen, my When you're weak, when you're lacking courage, when you're, when you're feeling defeated, and you haven't been feasting on the word of God, don't be surprised. Because your faith is saying, feed me. I'm atrophying. I'm, I'm dying inside because I need food. How do you feed your faith on the word of God? Amen? I wanted you to learn that man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word. that You've got to get the word of God in your heart. Because the word will feed your faith and strengthen your faith in a very real way. You've got to feed on his word. So my friends today, is your faith hungry? Feed on God's word. Are, are you in God's word? If not, you can't be surprised. We'll never know what it means to thrive or engage in God's best for our lives until we have a regular and consistent intake of God's word. So how do you get God's word in us? How do we get God's word in us? Look at this, watch. To get it in you, you've got to get you in it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got to get in it. Come on, you got to get in it. You got to get in it. To get it in you, we've got to get you into it. You've got to get into God's word in order to get God's word into you, in order to feed your faith and to strengthen you in the way that God wants to strengthen you. Chris, did you just take us through all of that to tell us to read our Bibles? Yeah, I, I did. It's like, read your Bible. Read your Bible. So important to be in church. It's so important to be sitting under the teaching of God's, God's word. That's why I'm always like, don't miss church. Be here. Like, hey, you got to get God's word. You got to get that intake of, of the teaching of God's word. But bigger than that, we, we envision a church of what we'd call self-feeders, people who know how to intake God's word on their own, to, to, read, to read God's word. I know that from many, reading the Bible can seem to be overwhelming and intimidating, um, and you maybe for some of you, you're like, I don't even know where to start. I mean, look how big this is, right? Where do I start reading God's word? Let me, let me give you some just like practical things to help us out as we, as we land, okay? It's important, first of all, to realize that the Bible, um, is not an ordinary book in that it's from front cover to last cover, from front to back, you, you read can read smoothly through it. You can, but what you need to understand is that the Bible is actually, you got to think of it like a library, all right? It's a library. And in this library, uh, there's collections of books, several books, many books that are organized on shelves, okay? Think of it like that. There's many books in here that are organized on shelves, and each shelf represents a, a different genre, a different type of book. And so, in these shelves, just like in a public library, you, you have all these different topics, okay? So you've got like the law, then you've got the prophets, and then you've got the, the poems, and then you've got wisdom literature, and then you get the eyewitness accounts of, of Jesus, and then you get to the, the letters of the epistles that are, that are written by the New Testament, uh, you know, Paul and the apostles, and, and, and then you get over, man, it gets a really, really exciting, wild stuff as you get over into the apocryphic, not apocryphic, not that. You get over into, don't go, <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was a slip. Oh, you're like, all right. You get over into Revelation, you know, and you, and you begin to see the, what God in, is going to do in Revelation. And so you think of it as, as books and shelves. Now, if you're digging in for the first time, I'd say this. Start, start with Mark. Just get your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'll give you a Bible on your way up. Just start in Mark. 
Start reading in Mark. In Mark, you're going to learn what Jesus did. You're going to learn just, oh, look, Jesus did that, and Jesus did that, and Jesus, look at all this great stuff Jesus did. By the way, that's the whole point of the whole Bible is to get you to know Jesus. Everything in your Bible points to who? Points to Jesus. It always does. Every, everything points to Jesus. So just go learn about Jesus. Start in Mark. Everything kind of pointing toward that center part, that, those gospels where you know Jesus. So start in Mark and get to know what Jesus did. And then jump over to John. And then John, you're going to read what, what Jesus said. And then just keep reading. Get into Acts. Read about the community, worshiping and serving God together and watching miraculous things take place. Get over into Romans. Then jump back into the oldies, get start in Genesis, Exodus, and just read your Bible. Today, there, there's, there's so many tools to help you read your Bible, right? I mean, like, version. It's a Bible app. Download it. It's been downloaded 196.5 million times. Come on. 190, 196.5 million people have downloaded the Bible under their phone, iPad, a device. And it has all sorts of versions. Maybe you don't know, you, 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 it has all sorts of versions. It has all sorts of reading plans. You can jump in there and get into a reading plan. I'm actually going through a reading plan on, on the version Bible. Another great thing about that is you can actually, there's, a, there's, a, there's an option to have it read to you. So I'm like reading my Bible and I'm like, oh, and I'm, I got to drive somewhere and I want to just be listening to God's word. And so I'll put it on and I'll put it in my little cup holder. My cup holder acts like a microphone so I can hear it really loud. And it's like reading the Bible to me. I mean, it's awesome. This is, there's so many tools now for us to really get into God's word. God's word, use them, use them. Maybe for you, the Bible seems, you know, so big and daunting. You're like, how do I how do, I do this? L- let me break this down just so you understand. Do you know you could read the whole Bible in 76 hours? Like if you start right now and stay up for 76 hours and you just read and reading, 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 read, you can read the Bible in 76 hours. Now, those of you who are being challenged to read God's word today, I would not suggest you take that route. <laughs> You're gonna get bummed out and probably quit. But here's what that means, is that when you break that down, it's 12 and a half minutes a day. In 12 and a half minutes a day, you can read through the whole Bible in 360, 65 days. 12 and a half minutes a day. That's half of one of those stupid shows you watch and wish you never watched, right? Come on. It's half of one of those. Just like, forget that. Just 12 and a half minutes. Feed your faith on the Word of God. Okay? It's interesting in Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I want, I want to land this, but, but Deuteronomy chapter 8 tells us that the manna was a picture of God's Word. When you go into the Old Testament and you read about how you read the instructions God gave them in Exodus chapter 16, you could do this for homework. In Exodus 16, the instructions God gave them in handling the manna, it's really interesting. Because he says you were supposed to go out and you were to gather the manna in the morning. Go out and get the manna in the morning. It's interesting, just keeping it in context of God saying this is a type of the word of God. He says, go get the manna in the morning. You guys need to gather it in the morning, okay? Watch this. It then says whatever they didn't gather in the morning it would begin, the heat of the sun would begin to wither it. And so it'd be out there and they'd try to go gather it at midday and it was starting to kind of, kind of decay. It was just harder to grab a hold of. And so I think that's really interesting because maybe some of us who, if we can't get up and get just some of the word of God in us in the morning, your day starts getting away from you and all of a sudden there's a billion other things to do and you're like, I'm gonna get there eventually. <laughs> and you just kind of, well, it's kind of, kind of like how he was telling them to get the man in the morning. Like if you didn't get it, it's gonna, it's gonna wither. Some people, some people did this. They tried to, they, they would try to go and store it up so they'd get a lot, not just for today. They'd get enough for today and tomorrow and the whole week. And so they're like, they come back with piles of it and they put it in their house like, oh, I've got enough. I went to church on Sunday. <laughs> I got the word of God. And what it says in Exodus 16, that whatever they didn't eat that day, it would begin to stinketh. It would start to stink and, and, and they couldn't eat it the next day. And so what they were supposed to do is go out and get more. Because what they tried to, I got enough. And he's like, no, you gotta, it's always gotta be a fresh daily intake or things start to stink. And some of you are like, why does my attitude stink? Well, I don't know, maybe. Things start to stink. And it sometimes starts with your attitude and it sometimes moves into, into other things in your life. Things just start to stink. Well, you need a daily fresh intake of, of just get scripture into your, into your heart. Get God's word into your soul. 
Now, I know when I preach a message like this that people start to maybe think, that's legalistic. I came to church today and you're telling me I gotta go do something. I gotta go read the Bible. Um, don't bring me in here and bind me all these rules and regulations. I'm free in Christ. Listen, my friends. If we were soldiers and happened to be marching, just happened to be marching out of here to go to war, and the sergeant said to us, the soldiers before we went, the sergeant got up and he remembered us, gang, I want you to fight well, but in order to fight well, you need to eat well. You need to be properly nourished for the battle that you're going to face today. And so I've provided a free meal for you. It's, it's, it's here with eat. And I want you guys to eat daily of the food that I provide for you so that you can fight well the battle you're being asked to fight. No one would say, you're legalistic. We get that. And just as much as we get that in that scenario, we need to get it in the real scenario that we live. Because listen to me, you are in a battle. You are fighting a war. There is an enemy who wants to take you down. Life can throw all sorts of curveballs at you. You're in a battle. And in order to fight well, you need to eat well. Church, eat well. Dig into God's word daily. But Chris, it's just so dry. Watch. It's just so dry. Like I read it. Come on, we can be honest with each other. Right? I read it, I'm just like, I'm not getting anything out of this. And they said, read my mom, I keep reading it. Some of us sometimes are like, it just feels dry. Do you remember the word of the Lord to the people who were dry? Keep digging. Just keep digging a ditch. Okay, I'm just going to keep reading. I'm just going to keep digging. I'm just going to keep digging. And what began to happen is that digging, that reading, that pressing in on a daily basis, even when it was dry, even when it, when it didn't all make sense, but that digging, that digging prepared the way for the water that God was going to send. The digging prepared the way for the miracle that God was going to provide. The digging prepared the way for the sustenance that those armies were going to enjoy as they dug the ditches. So hear the word of the Lord to those of you today who say it's dry. Keep digging, my friends. Keep digging into God's word because he will give you what you need in the time that you need it as you dig. And it's best to prepare for the issues you're going to face before you're facing them. You get into God's word, get God's word into you. And God, by his word, will uphold you through whatever and whenever the world throws, whatever it's got to throw at you. Get into God's word. Isaiah 55, 10, last verse. As the worship team comes up. Isaiah 55.10 says this. In the context of everything we've been talking about. It says, As the rain and the snow come from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Amen, church? Just as the rain comes down to, to bless the earth and to cause the, the plants to grow and the flowers to bud, just as it does not return without accomplishing what it was sent to accomplish, so is God's word, is it does not return void unto the Lord. It accomplishes what he sends it to accomplish. And church, we just need to get it in us. Dig in to God's word. Amen, church? Are you with me this morning? Come on. Is that all right? All right. God, we thank you for your word, Jesus. We thank you for giving it to us.